Welcome to the Indianola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. Uh, You know, so many things are going on in our world. Uh, Really difficult things, as you all know. And there are a lot of people that are pretty ticked off over the social unrest that we are seeing on television, political turmoil that is ramping up as we approach the election, and just everything that's happening around us bringing up to just about anybody any of this stuff, uh, it, it's pretty much guaranteed to get an opinionated response. And of course, all of the COVID-19 social distancing and quarantine rules that uh, most of us are following at least a little bit makes it all the worse. Restaurants are shut down, at least somewhat. Movie theaters are closed. Churches are running at 50% attendance or lower. The places that we normally go to have some fun and to get our minds off of things now require masks and other rules that many of us don't want to follow and just takes the fun out of everything. And it just starts building up this this anger within us because we've lost at least some of our outlets that we have for all the frustration. And I've talked with more people who are having to fight anger as of late, uh, so I thought it would be a timely message to address the emotion, this emotion of anger that God has placed in us. He's built it into us, but yet is still so hard to control at times. Some of you don't like the fact that I just said that, that God actually built this emotion of anger into us, gave us the ability to be angry. angry. And I, I think that some would even say that, well, anger is sin. It's just sin. No, it's not. It's not, and you have to understand that. Anger, if we're going to define it this morning, is a strong emotion of irritation or agitation that occurs when a need or expectation is not met. The origin, original, or the origin, I guess, of anger is actually found in the divine nature of God. It's found in the divine nature of God. Anger is an attribute of God. And just to prove this to you, the word that is translated into the word anger is used 455 times in the Old Testament, and 375 of those times, it's referring to God's anger. We have a God, we serve a God who has the ability to be angry. And we are created in his image. The bottom line is, we all possess this powerful emotion because God purposefully created us again in his image and with it. But when we allow the emotion of anger to be in control and our spirit to be subservient to it, it will always result in sin. And understand, anger is designed to benefit us, yet so few control it in such a way that it brings about the positive aspects of this strong emotion. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 26, in your anger, do not sin, or be angry and sin not. Controlled anger can motivate us to work harder and accomplish our goals. How many have ever been there? Working on something, it's not going right, you want to quit, and all of a sudden you get frustrated and anger starts swelling up and then you just get her done, right? Anybody ever been there? Come on, I'm not the only one. We've all done that. And that can be a good thing. Anger can also alert us that something is wrong and that we need to respond. When the need arises for us to defend ourselves or someone we love, anger often is the thing that calls us to action. I pity the person that would try to hurt my family. You know what I'm saying? God has placed that in us for a reason. There's some good that can come from it. Think of the love of a mother protecting her child, a classmate or colleague standing up to a bully, or an innocent bystander intervening on behalf of a victimized stranger. Generally speaking, anger can be the very thing that keeps us from being passive in accepting social wrongdoings, and it can fire us up to take action. Many of our culture's most important changes have come about because people got angry with the way things were and set out to correct those, change, those injustices. It's kind of like a heat. Anger is like a heat. It has many degrees. 
It ranges from mild, controlled irritations to hot, uncontrolled explosions. The word anger is an all-encompassing word that includes many levels of the emotion. But of course, you have to remember, anger that is uncontrolled is a powerfully destructive emotion. Alexander the Great was uh, one of the few men in history who, who seemed to deserve his uh, descriptive title. He was energetic, he was versatile, he was intelligent, and although hatred was not generally part of his nature, several times in his life he was tragically defeated by anger. The story is told of one of these occasions when a dear friend of Alexander's, a general in his army, became intoxicated and uh, began to ridicule the emperor in front of his men. Blinded by anger and quick as lightning, Alexander snatched a spear from the hand of a soldier and hurled it at his friend. Although he had only intended to scare the drunken uh, general, his aim was true and the spear took the life of his childhood friend. With that same spear, or, or uh, with the same spear, but he was stopped by his men. Because he took that same spirit and he tried to kill himself. He felt so bad over it. For days he lay sick, calling for his friend and chiding himself as a murderer. Alexander the Great conquered many cities and vanquished many countries, but he failed miserably in controlling his own anger. And I think that uh, story in and of itself can, can be a real lesson to all of us and all the things that we're going through. If we allow anger to keep building up inside of us, if we keep feeding it with the news and social media, it can boil over and we can cause severe damage without even meaning to. So what causes uncontrolled anger? How does this God-given emotion, meant for good, become a destructive force within our lives? And there's basically four main sources of uncontrolled anger. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. I've told you many times, um, before we get into those four things, I've told you many times from this pulpit that this is an area that, that I have uh, uh, struggled with in the past. And as I draw closer to Jesus, that becomes less and less of an issue. But man, there was a time in my life when anger was just, it just was right there all the time ready to fight. Anybody know anybody like that? Maybe you're like that. Where you just get so full of this built-up anger and you're like a pressure uh, valve on a hot water heater and you just explode. It's important for us to understand where that comes from. And again, here's four main sources of uncontrolled anger. First of all, hurt. Hurt. Hurt, a wounded heart. Everyone has a God given inner need for unconditional love. That's part of what makes us long for God. But when you experience rejection or emotional pain, it can wound your heart. Anger can become a protective wall and a defense mechanism that keeps people's pain away. And this comes up often for those that have been abused mentally or physically those who have been rejected over and over again. This is what happens in a marriage when a spouse has been unfaithful. We were never meant to be abused, but another person's sin can cause us harm. So the devil comes in and he twists God's purposes for anger, and we allow ourselves to become bitter, unforgiving, and we just let that anger build up over time until like a tea kettle, it just blows. What was meant to motivate us to work and fight against the wrongs we see then becomes the poison that left unchecked and out of control could cause us to commit some of the same wrongs ourselves. You know, the devil is a liar. And the truth isn't in him. He's the father of lies and his native tongue is lying. He's a master deceiver and his job description is to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't ever forget that. I mean, a great, a, a great example of this can be found in the book of Genesis, this, this hurt, this anger that can come from hurt. It can, be, it can be found in the book of Genesis when Jacob, as a father, loved his son Joseph more than the other 11 sons. 
Genesis 37, three through four says, Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. That's an issue, right? That's just wrong, that's unjust. A, a father should not love one child more than another child. But here, we clearly see that he did. And it says it, he loved him more than his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly orna ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So these brothers, they burned with anger to the point that they sold Joseph into slavery and then hid that information from their father. Their father was wrong, but his sin became their sin when they let anger become uncontrolled. And that's just what happens to us. We get hurt by somebody. We get angry about it. And it gets out of control, and then the sin that the person who hurt us committed becomes the very sin that we start to commit. The thing that we hate that was done for us, done to us, becomes something that we become, we become involved with. And we begin to hurt others in our anger. Is your heart wounded? Has someone hurt you? And has it created a, a building up of anger within you? I mean, that anger is natural, church. But what you do with it is so, so very important. It's absolutely imperative that you direct it in the right direction. And when it comes to people hurting you, a great verse to remember is Ephesians 6.12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It is really easy right now to be mad at things going on, to let that be a focus for you. But remember, no matter what is happening, no matter what someone is doing to you in the way of hurting you, your struggle is not against people. It's not against flesh and blood. Is anybody here this morning? Are you listening today? Hurt, a wounded heart, can be a source of uncontrolled anger. And this morning, if you have a wounded heart, if someone's wounded you deeply, you need to forgive that person. Otherwise, it will fester in you and say, well, I shouldn't have to forgive them. What they did to me is wrong. Remember this, forgiving someone doesn't negate their wrongdoing. Forgiving someone doesn't say what you did was okay. Forgiving someone takes them off of your hook and it puts them on God's hook. And that is so important for you to understand. But as long as you're hurt and wounded and a victim, you're never gonna be all you can be in the Lord. Another one of the four basic sources of uncontrolled anger is injustice and this refers to your rights being violated everyone has a standard of behavior that produces a sense of right and wrong within them fair unfair just unjust it, 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 we have that sense right when you feel that an injustice has occurred against you or others especially those you love and deeply care for you may feel extremely angry inside whether the offense is legitimately an injustice or if it's just a, perceived by you as an injustice, you must not let anger take control and be harbored in your heart. A biblical example of this is when Jesus was being arrested, Peter cut off one of the high priest's slaves' ears. He got mad. This was injustice. Jesus was an innocent man. He was being arrested, and Peter, as his friend, saw his beloved Lord, his beloved Savior, his great, great friend Jesus being unjustly treated and he picks up a sword and he cuts off the ear of that servant. He was reacting to the injustice that was happening, but he let anger lead him. Now this isn't to say that we are not to be protective of those we love, but in this case, Jesus had to be arrested. It was part of God's plan and Peter totally missed it he was just reacting to the injustice instead of responding to it like Jesus did. 
And Jesus did respond to it. Luke twenty two fifty one. But Jesus answered and said, stop, no more of this. No more of this fighting. And he reached out and he touched the ear and, and healed that servant. Another great example of this is when Joseph, again, was sold into slavery by his brothers. He could have been angry, and he maybe was for a short time. He probably would have been justified in that anger. The Bible doesn't really talk about him being really angry at his brothers, but when it came time to confront them, he showed them mercy and saved them when they didn't deserve it. Controlled anger responds first. Uncontrolled anger reacts first. And I am preaching to myself as much as anybody this morning because it is so easy, easy to react. Okay, we're going we're gonna to do a voting thing because you've got to wake up a little bit this morning. How many of you in the last week have yelled at the television when you were watching the news? Come on now. How many of you are so smart that you stopped watching the news a while back? Oh, amen. Amen. Controlled anger responds. Uncontrolled reacts. Injustices are going to happen in this world, and we are supposed to use our anger to fight against these injustices, but to remain controlled in our fight. Calculated actions, not reactive bursts of anger, are the difference. And sometimes the lines between the two are extremely fine. We must uh, uh, evaluate ourselves in these situations and make sure we are remaining controlled, not unresponsive, uh, because we can't just like, not respond to things, obviously, but controlled in our actions. Be ye self-controlled. Have you allowed injustices to fester in your heart to the point of having uncontrolled, red-hot anger? Is what you're dealing with a real or, a just, or just a perceived injustice? Because that's important to understand, too. If it's real, evaluate yourself. Are you using angry, accu accusatory words or aggressive body language to cause someone to feel guilty and obligated to you? I'll get them to listen. I'll just get aggressive. Maybe you're manipulating others with harsh words to pressure them into believing just like you, being very argumentative. Are you being led of the Spirit, giving gentle answers, leading others into the truth? A bit of advice for you. The person who gets the loudest vocally in an argument always loses the argument. My wife taught me that. You have a transparent pastor. The one who remains control, in control always wins. And I absolutely know that because I've lost almost every argument that I've ever had with my wife. And that's why. Injustice. Your rights being violated. The rights of those you love being violated can sit there and cause this welling up of anger in us. And if it goes unchecked, it'll boil over. I think we see that happening all over our country right now. Another source, number three, of uncontrolled anger is fear. Specifically when your future is threatened. Everyone is created with a God-given inner need for security. Turn to your neighbor and say, security. And when you begin to worry, feel threatened, or get angry because of a change in circumstances, you may be responding to fear. A fearful heart reveals a lack of trust in God's perfect plan for your life. It's been said that, that fear is the opposite of faith. But they are so closely related, and I've said this so many times from the pulpit, but I'm going to say it again this morning. Fear is the belief that something you cannot see is going to happen. Faith is the belief that something you cannot see is going to happen. They are the exact same definition. The only difference is that fear believes something bad will happen, and faith believes something good is going to happen. That's the difference. 
And a biblical example of this is when Paul became angry because David was so successful on the battlefield. He was threatened by David's popularity and thought that his own power, in his own power, and his, his own power and his own control would be lost. The people were singing, David has killed, or Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. And it was messing with his pride. 1 Samuel 18, 8 and verse 12 says, Saul was very angry. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. Fear. I'm going to lose something that I've had. I don't want to lose it. So fear sets in, and it sits down there, and it starts creating this uncontrolled anger. And if it goes unchecked, if you don't turn your fear to faith, what happens is it can just boil over. You know, David never did anything to warrant such feelings from Saul. Saul was angry because he let the fear of losing what he had transfer to anger against David. Are all these situations going on in the world causing you to have fear? Fear of losing your job or livelihood? Have relationships been weakened to the place of producing fear of losing them altogether? Are we worried and fearful of losing our freedoms here in this country? Fearful. Losing our house, our job, our security. I want to remind you of something. Our security is in the person of Jesus Christ. That is where we should find all of our security. Not in our bank accounts. Not in our own two hands, uh, uh, their ability to work and earn, even though that's a blessing. But what if that's taken away? What if you lose your job? What if you're in an accident and your hands don't work anymore? Where are you going to get your security then? It's got to be in Jesus Christ. And you might as well start now. In trying to deal with this fear, are you allowing anger to overcome you? Man, it's easy to slip into fear, living in fear. It's so easy. And not live in that place of rock-solid faith. You know, how many have done some projects around the house during the, this time it's pandemic time. It seems like a lot of people are. Menards is constantly packed. I think the, 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 the pandemic uh, has really blessed places like Menards and Lowe's and Home Depot, right? Amazon is very blessed, right? <laughs> seems like they're just maybe, almost to the point where you're going, I wonder who started this. <laughs> a lot of projects. We've been doing some projects around our house. And it's kind of weird. It's a weird feeling because you're like, what if everything just falls out? What if the bottom just falls out of everything and you, you lose your home? Why, why would I want to do any projects to make it better? You know what I'm saying? It's kind of a weird feeling. Why spend any money on that? Maybe we should just take everything and, and hoard it. But then our security is in our money. such a weird place to be in and folks what i'm saying is you got to be balanced you got to walk in balance and you got to live by faith not by fear something for you to remember don't spend a second feeding your fears feed your faith feed your faith Things will seem very differently when you stop feeding fear and you start feeding faith. The fourth thing, basic thing that causes uncontrolled anger, that it's, it's sourced, or uncontrolled anger is sourced in. When, when your performance isn't accepted and you're frustrated. Frustration. Frustration when your performance isn't accepted. Everyone has a built-in need to feel and be significant. And when your efforts are diminished by others or do not meet 
your own personal expectations, your sense of significance can be threatened. And over time, frustration uh, over unmet expectations of yourself or others can set in and become a major source of anger. And it's the frustration of never being good enough. I think there are many men here today who struggle with anger because they never felt like they were significant growing up. They didn't meet their father's expectations. There are women here today who struggle with the same thing. Some of you may even have anger building up inside due to the frustration of not feeling significant in the eyes of your parents or, or, or even your spouse. In the scriptures, both Cain and Abel brought offerings to God. But Cain's offering was clearly unacceptable. Cain had chosen to offer what he himself wanted to give rather than what God said was right and acceptable. And when Cain's self-effort was rejected, his frustration led to anger, and his anger led to the murder of his own brother. I mean, God didn't accept his offering because his offering wasn't done properly and done right. And what does Cain do about it? He gets mad and kills his brother doesn't make any sense it's kind of like what's going on all over this country against police departments it doesn't make any sense why attack those people you know there's some bad pastors out there too and if there's a rotten pastor out there maybe all pastors are rotten if there's a rotten electrician out there maybe they're all bad even even Corey Maybe, maybe there's a bad carpenter out there. Maybe they're all bad. Maybe there's a, is there any bad florists out there? No bad florists? Bull. <laughs> but maybe they're all bad because one's bad. It doesn't make any sense. Cain got mad and killed his brother, jealous that his sacrifice was accepted. Genesis 4, 3 through 5 and verse 8 says, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering, he, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, uh, let's go to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So it was even premeditated. Just craziness. And of course, in this case, the frustration of his own significance was due to his own actions. His offering truly wasn't significant. And there are times when you have done your very best and, and still are not recognized as being good enough. Cain didn't do his very best. There's times when we do, though. This actually can spill over into your heart being wounded and that becoming the source of your anger. It just all starts bundling up and building up within you. And if you feel a sense of frustration because of unmet expectations, whether they are your own or others, then evaluate yourself. Do you use angry threats and shaming words to manipulate someone into meeting your demands? Do you puff your chest up really big and get really loud and say forceful words so you can get your point across. I mean, come on, listen to me, right? That comes natural for me because that's an area I'm weak in, right? How many, how many know what I'm talking about? That's our reaction. We're frustrated because someone's not listening. So we get angry. The first step in overcoming this type of anger is to recognize a source. You're frustrated about this. Don't blow a rod over here because you're frustrated about that. And many times, this kind of anger, it reproduces itself. When a parent doesn't feel significant because of how they were treated by their own parents, their kids, high, high percentage and highly likely that their own kids won't feel significant. And it becomes a generational curse that doesn't stop. I had a very hot-tempered father at one time, and Jesus mellowed him. His dad was very hot-tempered and probably would be charged with child abuse the way he disciplined and he loved his kids. It wasn't that. He was just a hot-tempered man. 
These things can become generational curses really quick if someone doesn't put their foot down and say, enough's enough. I'm gonna respond instead of react. I'm not gonna let my frustration over here be the reason that I blow a rod over here. Some food for thought this morning. Before you reach for and react in anger out of frustration, remember that your kids are going to do in excess what you do in moderation. I look at my girls and I can see that, uh, yeah, I gave, them, I gave them some of my anger. I ain't proud of that. How do you resolve it? If you have anger issues, if you recognize that it's a problem in your life, you need to do something about it. You can't just let it sit there. Christian counselor June Hunt says this, if anger is allowed to smolder and ignite, it can transform you into, for, into a ferocious, fire-breathing dragon, scaring, even scarring, those whom you love most. The only power strong enough to slay this devastating dragon is the indwelling presence of Christ. When as a Christian you allow him to conform you to his character, then he will permeate your heart with his peace. You gotta own up to your anger and get it under the blood of Jesus once and for all. If you're angry all the time like I used to be, you wake up every morning and you say, God help me get my anger under control. I want it under the blood. I need your help today. And if you're sitting there going, well, you're not much of a Christian if you have to say that every day. Well, there's probably some things you need to say and maybe it's not the same area. I mean, everybody's got struggles, right? Some things go easy, some things are tough. I mean, some people wonder why the alcoholic just can't stop drinking. Or why this person can't stop gossiping. We all have little weak areas and we have to overcome them. And if anger is yours, man, do whatever it takes. And let's encourage each other in helping one another with these weaknesses. You gotta get into the prayer closet and let God, uh, God's presence just undo all the tangled, knotted up feelings inside. The Bible says don't let the sun go down on your, in your anger, and you shouldn't. You should make sure you make amends before the sun goes down. But sometimes you just need to go to bed and shut up. Right? Because his mercies are new every morning. And there's been a few times when it was just best that I just go to bed. You can't talk... <laughs> You can't spew when you're sleeping. And you wake up and you realize how dumb you were. But you get in God's presence and you let him undo all that tangled, knotted up stuff inside. And there's a perfect peace in God's presence. I think if God wouldn't have given me music, who knows where I, what road I would have went down. The anger the just pure anger, for no reason, just born angry, mad at everything, just susceptible to it. But every time I listen to music, music is, is not just in church, but in, in my own private time, in the garage, listening to the radio, playing the piano at home, and just maybe singing a little bit, coming in here sometimes during the week, or even in the evening, and just playing a little bit. There's something about it for me that that's what, what do they say? Music soothes the savage beast. Yeah, yeah, amen. I thank God for that. He gives us ways out. And when I get in his presence, that peace just floods and the anger leaves. And we need to go there to that place where we talk to God and spend time with him in his word every single day and bring those things that upset us so easily to the cross. You may all be, you may be all ticked off, but, uh, there's always a place to take it. I entitled this message, All Ticked Off and No Place to Go. There is a place you can go. You can take that anger to the cross every single time. Yeah, you don't have restaurants and 
roller skating rinks, do they have those anymore? Or uh, arcades, do they have those anymore? Where do we go for fun anymore? Restaurants, church, all these th- places that we go that, that we can't go. We don't have those places, but we can always take our anger to the cross. Always, 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 always. Jesus understands. So I'm going to close this morning with this. I I think about this verse in reference to the level of hurt that some people have felt. They have wounded hearts. I think about this verse in reference to injustice that we see against us personally. We see injustices in the nation, and politically we see them. But this verse speaks to that. This verse speaks to fear that wells up within us. Fear of losing what we we have and what we hold on to, what we find our security in. And it speaks to the frustration that builds up inside of us. It's Ephesians 4, 26 through 32. And I want you to hear these words. Concentrate as I read them today. Be angry this is the amplified version. I'm going to read all, the, all the, the amplified parts. It says, Be angry at sin, at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. Do not let your anger cause you shame, nor allow it to last until the sun goes down. And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger or harboring resentment or cultivating bitterness. The thief who has become a believer must no longer steal, but instead he must work hard, making an honest living, producing that which, that which is good in his own hands so that he will have something to share with those in need. I think that's a really important verse because when we start to feel like we're out of control in our anger, just go to work building the kingdom of God. Verse 29, do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. The Holy Spirit just told me to read that verse again. Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him by whom you were sealed and marked, branded as God's own for the day of redemption, the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault-finding, and slander be put away from you along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. That is a tall order. But I'm telling you, in this world we live in, with all of the garbage going on, with all of the anger that can set in, and we can react and get mad at, and I know I've been beating on this stuff week after week after week. I've been hitting it in all different ways, but folks, the church is never going to be successful if it's just angry at everybody else. Get angry at the devil. Fight like a man or a woman and get on your knees and pray. It's funny, you can't pray through clenched teeth. God, it just doesn't work. That guy makes me so angry. Can't pray that way. We need to walk in love, walk in forgiveness, in understanding, in compassion. And not be wimpy, but be mighty, controlled. It'll change the world. 
Jesus got all sorts of things. He was accused of all sorts of things. Insults hurled at him, all sorts of stuff. People trying to lay traps for him all the time. And you know what he always did? He just responded. When people came at him, he responded. He didn't react. He threw tables in the temple. Yeah, he did. But people weren't coming at him. He did that because he saw something that was gross, gross sin within his own house. But every time people came at him, at him, he responded. He didn't react. And usually he said a couple of things, and everybody just was like, drop the stone, walk away. The whole situation and atmosphere of around the situation was just like whew. are we supposed to be like Jesus it's not the loudest person who wins the argument it's the most controlled let's pray God I thank you so much that we don't have to be controlled by our emotions and today we focused on one of those anger we don't have to be controlled by it we know that you can be an angry God. We know that being angry is part of just our existence. It's, it's, it's what you put inside of us, but at the same time, Lord, it doesn't have to control us. Lord, I pray that you would help us, balance us, that anger would be a benefit when it needs to be, but would not be a constant hindrance, an emotion that takes us down roads that say things and destroy people and, and, and wreck situations that we can never come back from. Lord, we want to be people that are spirit-led, spirit-controlled. We want to be life changers. We want to leave people better than we found them, not just prove to everybody how angry we can be. Soften our hearts today, God. We understand righteous anger. But Lord, uncontrolled anger has no place in your children. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about just having an angry spirit, maybe one of those areas really touched your heart today. Maybe it was the hurt or the frustration or the injustice or one of those areas. The fear. But just give it to God this morning. And let his peace flood your soul. Because in the midst of the storms that we go through in this life, he can be our peace. We love you, Jesus. And we praise your name today. Amen. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.